Sugar, the day has finally arrived for us to put together the single most powerful gaming PC I've ever done on this channel. I mean, it's bound to be the most expensive as well. What we have here is the RTX 4090 Intel 13900KS all white gaming PC. And all of these parts have been filling a little pyramid in the corner of this room. It's been growing, it's been growing, and the day has arrived to finally put it together. And you guys, are incredibly privileged because you get to experience what should be the finest thing we have created in a long, long time. And hey, if this fan falling 30 centimeters to the floor is the worst thing that happens today, I think we've done all right. So let's get the ultimate gaming PC build 2023 all white huge case extravaganza started after a short word from thanking our sponsors. NVIDIA and Gigabyte. And I've actually been told to be very careful because this 4090 and this motherboard is actually owned by the Gigabyte rep personally with his own money. I think that's a bit of a risky move. Well, let's waste no time and actually get our build started by talking about the chassis because this is the, I think the first thing that actually arrived and is what sort of kick-started this whole build idea really because as you can tell, this is definitely a large case. This is not for the faint-hearted, it's not going to be the cheapest out there, but it's one of the few cases really that has the looks of tempered glass to really show off your rig, but then actually has so much airflow. Oh, I forgot how heavy this was. Oh, if I show you the top, you can see you can actually fit four 120mm fans there. Obviously, you've got the side ventilation as well. But then quite cleverly, underneath, you also have plenty of room for your GPU to breathe, or probably more likely for you to do like a soft or hardline liquid-cooled build, and then just have perfect airflow all the way around. You can also fit two 120mm fans at the back, and this is gonna look really weird if you don't populate them. So fortunately, we have also grabbed some fans from Fantex, the M25 120s. This was all sent out by Fantex, and obviously all of these parts were sent out by the different manufacturers, but I think they're gonna go together very, very nicely. And I must confess, the first time I actually saw this case, I was a little bit stumped as to how you actually get it open. Oh, the glass does come off though. Manual and bits and bobs come out, but you will have this little door and then the cables can sort of be rooted downwards. Oh, top piece does come out. Maybe it's screwed in. Yes, it is indeed. That then leaves this one piece here though. Oh, that now comes off as well, okay. And then it looks as if it's just a single thumb screw at the top to remove this fan bracket as such. I don't think I've ever met a case that reminds me more of an onion in my life. No, it's not round, it's just got so many layers and you've got to peel them all back to actually get to the core of it. But when you do, here you are. Basically, this is a case that is extra sized. It gives you more height, but let's be honest, for most people, it doesn't really matter. If it's sitting in your desk, well, you've got plenty of height available, but I do think it is gonna look a little bit odd if you don't populate this space at the top. So the prime suspect would be some form of pump or reservoir that could populate this space and be displayed, look really nice rather than have to sort of cram it into a smaller size chassis. But then I suppose as long as you've got something populating all of the fan slots, it will at least look okay. What we're doing here today is just using a 360 at the top, but it would make sense to go for push-pull really, just to give you that extra bit of depth if you're not going for hardline liquid cooling but I'm pleased with what we've got. I just know it's not for everybody. Oh, you know what? Someone out there is definitely gonna troll the whole world and do an ITX build on this. Now that would be funny. Let's park this to one side for a second and actually get our build started. So yes, we have our 4090 Aero and while we won't be using this so a little bit later in the video, honestly, I cannot wait to see this. I've heard that it's big, which is definitely why this chassis came to mind, but obviously this is one that doesn't rely on loads of RGB lights and things. This is very much an all white GPU. It deserves an all white case and it's gonna look stunning. But here we go, here we go. Look at this. And actually on the overhead, it doesn't look quite so big until you turn this round and really start to see the scale of it. I mean, this is a 4090 Aero and here is a 4070 FE. <laughs> Do you see the difference here? <laughs> This thing is gigantic. I've definitely seen so many people talking about this. This is definitely a fan favorite and I can definitely start to appreciate why. You've got these silver accents on the back plate here. You've got this huge pass through and obviously in combination with the amount of cooling got on this is gonna give you fantastic temperatures even for the very power hungry 4090. But let's start our adult Lego, shall we? And actually start to get these things put together. So we're going to grab our motherboard, which as you guessed is also in the aero range. These were sort of originally geared more towards creators. 
I mean, obviously, as we know, the difference between gaming motherboards and creators isn't really huge, especially in terms of performance. It's more down to the I.O., but people love the aero range because it comes in this all-white design and, again, doesn't rely on RGB. It just looks cool. And don't forget that this is a Z790 motherboard, so it comes with loads of the latest features, mainly PCI Generation 5 for both an SSD and the graphics card, which is going to make your PC incredibly future-proof when it comes to graphics. I can already see that we've got some silver accents on this, so it is going to perfectly match our GPU. But here it is, look, our Aero motherboard. I mean, look at the size of the VRMs and the PCI Gen 5 heatsink on that. That's insane. I'm happy with that. That looks pretty insane, especially once we kit it out with the rest of the white components. But this motherboard does also have a little trick up its sleeve, because if you have a look at the top here, you'll see it says Display Port In. And the clever thing with that is you can grab your graphics card, plug it straight into your motherboard, and then you have one USB that goes out to your monitor, and then you get your usual display output in addition to USB functionality, all without having loads of cables going between the two. Let us get our production line literally off the ground for a second, and we can start by installing our CPU. And this is going to not necessarily be controversial, but I mean, in terms of what people should actually buy watching this video, there's going to be very few of you where this will make sense. This is the 3900KS. This is a 24-core gaming CPU, and it's a bit of a weird one because technically the competitor to this would be the 7950X3D, but that can get a little bit confused when it comes to provisioning. There's quite a lot of things you have to do to make sure that gaming CPU is running its best, and then if you want to use it for a productivity, as I say, it can get a little bit confused. It's probably better than when I first used it, whereas this has had a few more years to mature a little bit in terms of Intel sort of parking the efficiency cores, using the performance ones properly. It's not as reliant on software. I'm probably talking gobbledygook. Basically, this is meant to be the absolute fastest gaming CPU you can buy, but realistically, is going to trade blows with the 7800X3D. This was for the people that want to spend stupid amounts of money and want the very best and also want to have 24 cores, whereas if you go for Ryzen, you'll be limited to 8, but for gaming, that's probably still the optimum choice, especially when it comes to value. So yeah, this is definitely for those that want the absolute best, they want the flexibility, and they have plenty of money to spend. But realistically, if you're watching this video and you do want to go for Intel, then most people should go for the very, very good 13900K, or to be honest, the 13700K, and save yourself that little bit of money. I really hope this is helpful. Oh, Intel's the best. No, AMD is the best. As always, it depends. It is very satisfying popping this in though, very satisfying. We will of course also be needing some RAM and this is a kit from Corsair. This is DDR5, 5600 megahertz I'm afraid because I don't actually have faster than that in any other color than black. Pop open the RAM slots two and four and we get that satisfying click. For the SSD, I was hoping to use a Gen 5 drive for this, but unfortunately it's not actually arrived in time. I was going to go for one from Crucial, but assuming this is a gaming PC, honestly, I am going to be so surprised if it makes any difference whatsoever. This is something we'll be testing as soon as it arrives, but for now we're going for something almost as quick when it comes to real world performance. This is the 990 Pro from Samsung. This is only a one terabyte, but if you do want to get slightly faster speeds or at least more consistent speeds, then going for a two terabyte probably would make more sense. It's not going to affect the look of this system, nor its real world performance, really. Which now means that we can actually move on and install this inside our chassis, which I think should be pretty normal. But I admit I'm a little bit cautious of this build because of course I haven't actually used this chassis before and it's a bit weird. But this bit should be business as always. Use our unusually silver screws to get this into place. And then we can stand this up and have our first look. Actually, I do quite like having a little bit of black on the motherboard because it just draws your interest in. I mean, one of the issues we're going for all white is you kind of need to fill everything up evenly and you need to almost give yourself focal points everywhere. Whereas if you use color to sort of draw your eyes to the components you want to see, that's quite a cool little way of well, making your build look a little bit better, I guess. As we take this opportunity to start plugging in our I.O., I will also shout out that these cables are black, which is kind of a bit annoying. If you did want to go for a literally all-white build, you would have to use some cable extensions. Or, of course, you can do what we're using, which is going for black cables, or maybe even better, go for black and white cables to make everything tie in just that little bit better. Oh, Fantex, no, why? They were so close. Look, all these cables all jet black, and then the HD audio is still ketchup and mustard. There's no need. I'm not plugging it in. We're not gonna use it anyway. What should we do next, cooler or fans? 
Let's go with the fans. We're only using fans here today, apart from the radiator. I mean, to be fair, I haven't actually used these before, so I have no idea how good they are. I mean, to be honest, for case fans, you can pretty much get away with any premium fan, because you're gonna have them on nice and quiet anyway. It's more the ones that you're using for high pressure, so things like the radiator fans. That's where you really need a nice balance, I suppose, of performance and quiet. But let's have a look, shall we? Even the cables are white, which is pretty cool, but if you do need to use extensions, they're black. What's the point in that? Oh, okay, that's pretty cool. They don't daisy chain together magnetically like the new modern ones from Corsair do. But you do have this little daisy chain connection on it, which is gonna mean you only need, what? I suppose one cable or two cables, one for RGB, one for fan speed. That's nifty. Rather bizarrely, we have actually run into a very slight issue that isn't an issue, but it's just very confusing. Bearing in mind this is a Fantex case with Fantex fans. They don't actually have enough room for these little daisy chain pin connection things to fit between the side of the case and the fan. Why would you not have the tolerance for this? I mean, I've got to admit, this would have been a lot easier if the fans did properly magnetically clip together because this is still a lot of cables. Well, they got in eventually. Now just three more to go. And the other problem that I'm having with these fans is that the back's just not particularly attractive. And because you have to have these cables in the right place, you can have an upside down Fantex logo all the way down the bottom. I think I'd go for something else. Oh, I swear we must have been going for an hour, but it is hopefully done now when it comes to fans. That was faff. Seriously, grab yourself some magnetic ones, something simpler than this. So many cables, so many things to plug in. I mean, I suppose it was always gonna be this way, but it was definitely a little bit more fiddly than I was expecting. This is what it's starting to look like around the back. These doors do at least open up, so you can sort of cable manage, I suppose. And I like the fact that you could put SSDs in here or just use this as sort of tie down points for stuffing some cables and things. That's quite cool. Something that's less impressive though, is the fan cables on the fans. Really starting to not like these, because they're also really short. So trying to get them to daisy chain together is a bit of a faff. And I thought, well, it's fine, because you've got these extensions, but actually you've only got extensions for the fan speed. For the RGB, the cable is actually to convert it to addressable RGB. So yeah, definitely not a fan. But unfortunately we are not out of the woods just yet, because it's now time for my favorite thing ever, Radiators. This is one from NZXT. This is the Kraken Elite 360 RGB. Comes in white. This one also comes with the LCD, which is why I wanted to use it here today, because I do think it looks pretty darn impressive. Well, let's have a look what we have inside the box. Three white RGB fans in bags when they really don't need to be. Our adapter box and things, and then some black cables. But last, and certainly not least, we have more pointless packaging, and then our white liquid cooler. And of course, in an ideal world, these would all be matching so you could sync them up a lot easier. Maybe you could get the matching NZXT fans? Or to be honest, what I'd probably do would be to go for Lee and Lee or Corsair's new IQ Link stuff. Maybe even Thermal Tape, because adding them all together is just gonna be so much easier. And cable management on this thing, also very annoying because you've got these little holes for all of the cables, but as soon as you actually put this into place, it blocks them, so you have to like pre-route them before you screw it in and it just gets complicated. I, I think the potential here was so good, but there's just been a few things that have already started to give me a few annoying vibes. Well, all that is in, and to be fair, the whole rig is really starting to come alive. This is starting to look pretty smart. Let's finish up this cooler install though by inserting the back plate and then using these 1700 screws. Tubes down the bottom, hopefully in the software you'll be able to rotate the LCD. Oh, give it a nice little push. Use the thumb screws provided. Tighten with a screwdriver. And there you should have your CPU cooler installed. And because this case is so large, you can actually fit a 360 radiator with the tubes this end without it looking weird. In fact, I'd go as far to say it makes the whole thing look a lot cleaner because you don't have some horrible dangly cable there. It's really starting to come together. We are at least getting there now. This has been a very long build so far, but it is time to insert our power supply, then our GPU, then I think we should be ready to turn this on. And as already mentioned, we are going for some custom cables. I mean, the power supply that we're actually using is the HX1500i from Corsair. This is definitely the most overkill power supply that I have ever used. It even actually comes with an even bigger kettle lead. The cables that we're upgrading it with comes courtesy of Corsair. This is the Pro PSU Cable Kit. And these aren't my absolute favorites. I think cable mod cables are actually a little bit nicer, but this is a fair bit more affordable, especially if you go for the real premium cable mod cables. But at the time of filming, this kit doesn't actually include one of the new 12 volt high power connections for the 4090. So you are going to need to grab something out 
else. This is the 600 watt cable from Corsair. Do be careful when you're buying these because some of them are going to be rated for 300, maybe even 450 watts. Obviously for a 4090 to work, you need the 4600. But again, this isn't braided, so check out cable mod. Slightly different to normal, the power supply then slots in here at the top. And I do like the fact that you can actually access all of these cables very easily. If you do want to modify or make changes to this system, you don't need to unplug everything just to be able to access it because all of these cables, or all of these sockets at least, are very easily accessible here at the side. This build is just so needlessly complicated because there's so many things to plug in. Actually, it's not the case. I don't really have any issues per se with the case, only minor things. But the combination of all of this stuff in there, mainly really being the fans and then a separate controller for the radiator and things, it might not sound that much when you're sort of doing your parts list, but it means that you have all these sort of cables and things to plug in, all these different adapters and just the requirements pretty much go through the roof. So if you do want to go for a high-end rig, be prepared to do a lot of cable management. But anyway, hopefully from this point onwards, it's plain sailing as long as everything works, even if some RGB fans and things need reconfiguring, that's fine. I just want to make sure that the whole thing boots. Which means it is finally time for the star of our show, the most powerful graphics card you can buy for gaming, the RTX 4090 in this lovely white aero flavor. DLSS 3, ray tracing, tensor cores, incoming. Hmm. Unfortunately, before we get there, I will actually add that the cable management at the bottom of the case isn't quite deep enough. And what I've managed to do is actually sort of scrape this Gen 5 cable on the bottom of the motherboard, which is a little bit of a shame. I mean, Fantex, what you needed to do was just give yourself a little bit of a bigger gap at the bottom, like actually have that hole bigger, because I've kind of ruined this now. And I use it for this build all the time I'm in the room, but we know what power cables are like. So I'm going to have to replace that if I'm going to use this long term. So here it is, our RTX 4090, hopefully completing our rig. In she goes. And after all that, this Gen 5 cable doesn't actually reach. Well, we'll bring it around the top instead, which isn't gonna look as good, but there you go. You're just gonna need a longer cable. And there you have it. And it's a shame that we had to end on that little bit of a sad note because where the power supply is so high at the top, this cable is just not long enough, sadly. But all in all, other than that, I think this is looking pretty darn cool, right? Ah, oh, let me show you the back of the case without any cable management at all. It's gonna be doable, but there's a lot of bulk here. Good luck. Right, moment of truth then, we have our keyboard, mouse, PC-centric mouse mat, limited edition. Once it's gone, it's gone. Link is down below. There we go. Oh, we've got RGB on everything other than the bottom and that one for some reason. But I tell you what, it's looking pretty cool. That is an all white gaming PC, is it not? I love the little RGB strip that you've got, makes the whole thing come alive. All of the fans, when they are working, are gonna look absolutely incredible. Probably would set them to white to get something that really does resemble the theme. But at the moment, we still have a black screen. So can we get this to work? Let's try swapping out for the 4070, as this should eliminate the idea of it being the GPU. Hmm, <laughs> that's not ideal. <laughs> now that was just weird. I guess it could have been an initialization problem. Maybe it was just something that needed to be reseated. Either way, we're here. So just give me a second to get XMP sorted, load of games on this, and we'll show you the benchmarks. And thankfully, I'm extremely pleased to say that actually getting this set up and running was very straightforward. It was just that the bottom fans were plugged into the one that was off rather than all being connected and daisy chained together. So I've fixed that, only took about three, four minutes. And overall, I am very proud and very happy of what we've put together. But I know I sound like a broken record at this point. I still don't get the point of the chin. I know it's so you can put extra fans and things at the top, but this really does need some form of liquid cooling or something there, doesn't it? I don't know. Get Get creative, seriously guys. Let me know down in the comment section below what you would do to this to improve it, I guess. Just what would you put in that little space just to make it look complete? Because it's almost there, but it's not quite in my opinion. But anyway, let's see what this is like in terms of performance and we'll start with some Diablo 4. And I have to admit that this is one of the best bits of my job because I am literally working right now while I'm actually playing Diablo at the same time. Pretty cool. And for a change, I've actually got all of our CPU cores up here so you can see everything that's going on. If you look at, what's that, CPU 3, that's the core that's being properly hammered, if you like, by this game. But I mean, let's be honest, this is not the most demanding thing out there, even running at 4K ultra settings. In terms of frame rate, we are, of course, absolutely crushing this with around about 200 frames a second without any fancy upscaling or frame gen or anything like that. And the thing that does also impress me a lot is the fact that our system is very, very quiet. I mean, we probably should have saw this coming, right? Because yes, we've got high-end components, but we've got so many fans. 
But if you want a little noise test, there's basically nothing. A very low hum. If you have any form of noise whatsoever, regardless of whether it's speakers or headphones, you won't hear a thing. But next, I'm interested in probably seeing how far we can take this CPU, which always means opening a game that a lot of people don't realize is very CPU bound. Some Planet Zoo. And true story, yesterday I got to feed some gorillas. Did you know that actually most of the time they don't eat bananas? They're too sugary. But here we go. Anyway, apparently it is at night. This is Planet Zoo, fairly early-ish in the game. It's one of the larger ones, but obviously the more you put in, the more dense it gets and the more you're going to hammer your processor. But at the moment, you can see that our frame rate is still very high, but it's not like crazy high. And unfortunately, this is just a limitation of the CPU, the game engine, a little bit of everything really. We'll demonstrate this by lowering down the resolution from 4K in just a second. And this is a prime example really of how difficult it can be sometimes to sort of work out what's going on. Because if you look at the stats at the top left hand corner, you'll see that our GPU is being utilized around about 76%. So you know that there's some bottlenecking there. But then if you look at the CPU, none of these cores are maxed out either. It is actually spread quite evenly across them. So by looking at this, you might think that it's the game engine, right? You might think, well, we're not CPU bound, we're not GPU bound. What is it? I mean, it's not RAM, it's not video memory, what could it be? But it's only from doing testing with loads of different CPUs and comparing the numbers that I can verify that if you upgrade the CPU to something better, you'll get a better frame rate. But this doesn't really make it very clear. Especially when you think we're running a 3900KS, that's pretty much the best gaming CPU money can buy. Except maybe Ryzen. I mean, yeah, let's demonstrate. 125 5 FPS at the moment. We'll lower this down to 1440p. Yeah, there you go. Look, ignore the fact that it's not taking up the whole screen. We're basically staying at the exact same FPS, which of course, if we were GPU bound, then this would go up, right? But actually our frame rate is pretty much staying about the same. It's actually gone down slightly because we've gone from night to day. So there you go, bottlenecking at its finest. But while there are clearly going to be diehard fans of Planet Zoo watching, I guarantee a lot more people want to know about Hogwarts Legacy. And look at that! Already you can see our utilization for both RAM, which is at almost 21 gigabytes, and then video memory at 12 and a half gig, are showing you that this is actually properly taken advantage of this system. This is a bit of a weird one because when it came out, it wasn't the most optimized game out there. But there's a lot going on here. There's a lot of textures, a lot of things that need to be stored and utilized and swapped between the different components. And you can see that if you do have a high end PC, you are able to take advantage. I mean, let's have a look at our settings. What we've got DLSS running at quality. Quality. This is good. Frame gen is actually currently enabled uncapped frame rate. We are also running this at ultra and ray tracing is on and it's set to ultra. So what you're seeing here is as good as it gets. Oh, I need to return to the quest area. I'm so sorry. But what we're doing in terms of frame rates, 132 frames a second. That is pretty impressive actually. Bearing in mind, as I say, this is everything turned up to max and you're getting 130 FPS. I mean, obviously this is with DLSS 3 and DLSS 3 is frame generation. So essentially it renders alternate frames and then adds one in the middle. It's very good at doing this, but just for due diligence, what happens happens if we do decide to turn this off and now we're getting about 90 to 95 frames a second so there is some noticeable loss there I mean I think everyone's going to be happy with this personally because you can pick whichever setting that you want I've actually found that DLSS 3 can be really useful in games especially if you're running like a 4070 or 4080 we need that boost of extra FPS but something like the 4090 is so powerful anyway that to be honest, it's not necessarily something you need to use, but I think it's a bit of a no-brainer to use it in a title like this, especially when you're gonna use ray tracing, it just allows you to have that smoother overall experience. And shout out, by the way, to the CPU, all of the cores are running at 5.5 gigahertz. And not only are those the clock speeds, have a look at the thermals as well. 69, 67 degrees on the CPU, and the GPU is at a mere 55. Bearing in mind this is a 4090. This case is a big fan of high-end components. Okay, we've made that joke already, let's move on. But anyway, enough talk about boring clock speeds. Let's actually show you something exciting with me flying across a room after being blown to smithereens with some Halo Infinite. And what you're seeing here is absolute max setting. So this actually has ray tracing as well, because as we know, ray tracing uses loads of different techniques. You can get reflections, you can get ambient occlusion, you can get shadows and things like that. And this is actually using the ray trace shadows that just makes the lighting look a whole lot better. 
And normally I would say it's probably one to turn off for multiplayer because you want as high a frame rate as possible. But when you're able to get 150 FPS in the first place, even with this setting turned on, you can have your multiplayer cake and eat it. But of course, this is a multiplayer game and I need to test this out for purists. So let's turn the ray tracing off entirely and we'll set the resolution to 1440p, or just above, at 2573 by 447. And let's see what it does to the frame rate. It, of course, increases it by quite some margin. We're now getting around about 225, 230 FPS, which of course means that if you do want to play on a 240 hertz 1440p display, then you are going to be able to do that quite easily. You'll get the benefits of higher resolution, you have the benefits of a larger screen, or still maintaining that absolutely insane fluidity that you get from a 200 40 hertz display with a game that can actually be driven very close to that 240 hertz limit. It's very, very cool. But anyway, there we go. Our absolutely ridiculous, ball to the wall, all white, 4090, 3900 KS system that is so epic, even the dog is going ballistic. If you've enjoyed this video, please smash the like button. It really helps out. And of course, get yourself subscribed if you're not already to check out more like this. And if you do want to check out current pricing on anything featured in this video, then you can find it linked down below with my Amazon affiliate links. I'm going to go on to the door now. Thank you so much for watching. We'll catch you in the next one.